I'm Trevor Babb with the Contemporary Guitar Blog, and I have two very special guests joining me from The Hague today, Pete Harden and Santiago Lascurain, who are the guitarists from the Dutch chamber ensemble, Ensemble Klung. And we're here today to talk about their new record coming out featuring a brand new work from Dutch composer Peter Adriens called Environments, an epic 85 minute work in three parts. Um, Pete and Santiago, thank you so much for being here today. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah, Thanks great to be here. Awesome. So um, let's talk a little bit about Peter Adrian's, uh, just a little bit who this composer is. Uh, this is someone you guys have worked with before. Let's talk just a little bit about his music and his aesthetic and what he's interested in exploring through composition. Yeah, yeah. Peter lives here in The Hague. Um, I think is one of the most interesting composers working not only here in the Netherlands, but also on a, on a, on a broader level. He's somebody that he's actually very influenced by the American experimental tradition, people like Lucier and, and, and James Tenney, dealing with sound on a really fundamental level, like sonic uh, explorations and, and investigations. But he also combines that with, you know, he, he studied here in The Hague with Louis Andreessen and combines that with a sort of Dutch aesthetic of new music where, you know, we're using a lot of amplification. We're dealing with a uh, very lively sound, let's say, lots of saxophones, brass, electric guitars, something that, you know, the when you're in the space and we're not in concert spaces at the moment, but when you're in the space experiencing it, then, then the, you know, you're feeling the sound vibrations around you. It's a very physical experience, I think. Uh, his music. And he deals with, you know, as a composer, I think he deals with the, the biggest subjects. He deals with what, what time is and what the passing of time is and how that, what the experience is for, for listeners and, um, and you know, in, on a fundamental level, starts uh, probing all these key little questions about how we, how we uh, live, actually, and environments really starts getting to some some critical issues about you know politics and religion and and what we do on our daily uh, on a daily basis with our time and with our free time and how much choice we have in that and and or not. Excellent, yeah. And uh, this is not the first collaboration between Ensemble Klang and Peter Adrians as well. Um, I think it's your first recording that featured his work, right? We, we've been working with Peter for quite a while. Like, I think, um, I don't know if the date's in front of me, but I think that goes back to around 2007. Mm. And actually, and we, he wrote a big cycle, cycle of waves, pieces called waves for us that we still perform. Um, and they deal with um, beating patterns, uh, li little notes that are just offset from each other. Um, and they're big. We literally waves of sound that uh, pass across half hour long periods, something like that. Um, we recorded that on an album. That was our first album that we put out on our own label. Um, and then in the meantime, that, that, that's like a really interesting set of pieces that was also using on, in, on a guitar level, using lots of ebos, lots of loop stations, um, you know, stacking harmonic series on top of each other and then starting to remove different sounds from the different loops. Um, you get this beautiful, warm kind of uh, embrace in the sound. And he pairs that with sign tones, which are a key element in his uh, compositional language, I would say. There's a lot of sign tones also in uh, environments. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we did a little quartet of his phrase and fraction, which are a 20-minute piece, two 10-minute pieces, and, and phrase is a sort of sublimely beautiful, and fraction is sublimely brutal. I would say they were wonderful little pairs. So that's also been uh, released on a, on an Irish label. Mm. Well, cool. So let's talk a little bit about the genesis of environments. How did this piece come about? Who approached whom? Um, and um, was was this like a smaller piece that became a huge piece, or did you always have a desire for this to be something of massive proportion? It goes back Christmas four years ago, or just after Christmas and New Year four years ago, and, and I was catching up with Peter, and I always ask him, 
you know, what have you been doing? What have you been writing? And, I, you know, this was after the festive season. I was hoping he'd had a, a break. And I was like, what have you done over Christmas and New Year? And he said, well, I spent it writing microtonal guitar music. And uh, knowing that I would be fascinated by that. And I said, well, I would like to know a lot more about that. And where is that heading? And um, what, what, what's it for? And it wasn't written at that point for any commission. It was just something that he was little sketches and ideas that he was toying with. He restrung a guitar at home and started playing with the um, the, the sort of uh, shimmer or the the hazy uh, shimmer that you get if you have a lot of uh, strings tuned to the same pitch but not quite mm -hmm. exactly the same uh, tuned exactly the same. Um, and that was really the beginning of this piece, and and we started um, talking immediately about. I said, I, I think that we could do this with Ensemble Clang. You know, what's the resultant piece going to be? What, where, where, where do you want this to head? And he started dealing later that year with the idea of combining it with spoken word texts. Um, so through the 85-minute piece, that's in three movements called mono, uh, watts, and stereo, there's a spoken word, recorded spoken word text over each of the three movements. But on a fundamental level, down at the genesis and at the, at the sort of nuclear level, let's say, are still these microtonal guitar pieces and that to do with the uh, cyclical rhythms and cyclical rhythmic patterns that seem like they're repeating but actually aren't repeating ever. And that's the, the core structure of the 85 minute piece. And over the months then, we just uh, started toying with toing and froing, saying, you know, which instruments can we add? What do we take away? How big is this going to be eventually? And and it did. It, it is a monumental piece. It is built from the ground up. I don't think it shares any kind of form or format with many pieces that exist. Um, when we do it live, we have a small quartet of musicians in the middle of a circle, and that's the uh, myself and Santiago, an accordion and a, and a keyboard. Outside of that sit the audience in a circle and outside the audience sit uh, a set of six or eight speakers and outside the eight speakers sit more performers also so surrounding the the audience so you get a full sort of sonic three-dimensional experience very cool so this is something that is very immersive and um sound all around the audience um, and so this is something that it sounds like that you've had the opportunity to do live. It's not something that has been put on hold for live performance since, you know, we've been shut out of concert halls for over a year now. We got the premiere of the full three movement work done in with Ensemble Clan. We have a little festival here in The Hague called Musical Utopias and uh, where we explore people like Peter who are really striving for the highest artistic uh, goals in, in, their, in their output, really like reaching for the stars, let's say. And I think mm -hmm. Peter is one of those people. Um, and we did uh, the premiere of it in Music Utopias two years ago now, two and a bit years ago. In the meantime, we recorded it for this album. Um, and we were supposed to perform it at a couple of big venues in the last uh, year, but those have all been postponed. So mm -hmm. we just got the premiere in and I uh, can't wait to get back on stage and perform it for a live audience again. Yeah, great. Um, well, um, let's talk a little bit about the texts and where those texts come from in um, this piece. You've got everything from the art of motor, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and um, Alan Watts. Um, talk a bit about these texts and, you know, their uh, significance to this idea of, you know, time and how we experience time and, you know, how we spend time and pass through time. Yeah, I think Peter puts it very eloquently. He says he's not sure whether the whether he found the texts or chose the texts or whether they came looking for him. Um, I think they're, they're deeply personal. I think some of them are, relate to things that he heard and read when he was young other things he's picked up uh, in the last, uh, you know, 20, 30 years of his life. Um, indeed, we, the, the first movement, mono, um, the, the three movements we, you, you could, if you want to be really reductionist, is reduce each movement to a shape. And the first movement, mono, is, is, is a line. 
And the second movement, what, is a circle. And the third movement, stereo, is a square. Hmm. All left, right. Um, and the, the, the piercing, the, the Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, is really a, you know, we, the, that whole movement is a single note, just one note, one pitch, more or less, but microtonally tuned. Created all these uh, beautiful waving and, and beating patterns and, and beautiful sort of resonances um, and different colors. And on top of that, Peter wanted a, a section of uh, Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, this idea of a journey just going on a straight line and there's wonderful passages about, you know, reaching the Dakotas and you're just going in a straight line. Maybe you're not looking for something. Maybe there's no destination. Maybe it's just about this journey moving forward. Um, and that was just a text that felt very apposite, I think, for, for that movement. And the second movement, the Watts, is a radio lecture by Watts. Peter just fell in love with the sound of his voice. He just has this beautiful uh, sort of... Uh, rich uh, way of talking and beautiful sense of timing that he's as though he's hitting upon these ideas while he's talking um and that that was the first text that was the first movement that was that was completed um and then the last text for stereo is is a, i think probably the most personal for peter that's something he's he's adapted himself uh, from, from the Kabbalion, and that's uh, the principle of polarity, this idea of stereo, this idea of left-right. And I think talks, I, I think it's a, it, it, it's a comment, I think it's a call for calm uh, in the present-day idea of polarization, the idea of uh, uh, society splitting hard left and hard right in, in all sorts of ways. And that's a, a very beautiful text, actually, about saying maybe what we think of as being two opposites, two polar opposites, maybe they're not so different at all. And that's a reflection on that across the 20 minute movement. Nice. Well, let's get um, Santiago roped in here um, to talk a little bit about um, restringing the guitars. And you, you're both using three different guitars in each of the three different parts of this piece. And right. poor Santiago is nursing a sliced thumb today. Um, <laughs> But um, and so we won't get to, you know, see him play anything, which I was hoping we would get to see him demonstrate a few things. But um, just talk a little bit about, you know, it's, we'll start with mono um, and how the guitars are restrung and, um, you know, all these microtonal differences that you're talking about and getting all these wild beating patterns. Um, talk a little bit about what is what the setup here is in this first part. Can I? Shall I Take it. Go ahead. I think <clears throat> I think it's interesting to to talk first about um, what's the second movement. Okay. Because I, I the way I understand it, otherwise correct me, Pete, is that 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 was the 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 birth of the the material for the first and the second the first and the third movements. And I I am I'm much more familiar with with the the genesis of of that part. Because I met with Pete, uh, with uh, Peter, to to um, find out how it could be performed that part that he had written for the for the guitar. The in the in, I'm talking about Watts, right? So what what uh, Pete just said that it's uh, uh, rhythmic cycles that sound. As if they were the same, but none of them are the same because they they are com they are combining uh, different lengths of um, of uh, an eighth note, dotted eighth note, and sixteenth notes at different combination, using always a B minor, what is it, ninth, eleventh chord. Right, you've got so it's, it's like an it, A major triad and a B minor triad, right? Okay. So it's it's that chord only, right? The whole time. That's it. It's like how can it can it get to less material? You know, it's I I find it amazing that it's just a small a chord that anyone can play with. Anyone with six fingers can play. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was very 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 curious how that could be performed on the on the acoustic guitar on the classical guitar in different ways 
to enhance different uh, sonorities of the of the guitar and of the chord, depending on the part of the piece, yeah, of the of the movement of the second movement of what. So we met a couple of times, <clears throat> and we thought of, we explored like um, scordaturas on the guitar to to play this this ascending arpeggio. Um, and what ways, in which ways would it would it sound better? And we we found um, uh, th that the best way was to just play with the, the the normal tuning of the guitar, because in that way the 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 natural tuning of the guitar, the normal tuning of the guitar, would enhance the harmonics of the chord, right? So if we if we would tune down the E string to D, when you play the B, it's a minor third, so it doesn't react. Whereas if you if you keep it to the E and you play the second the second string, you're playing the fifth of the of the string. So then there's more resonance in the in the chord in the in the chord, right? Um, and then from there, we discovered I I I went home with with that uh, in mind. And I came back later on another day with like, I think eight ways of playing that chord on the guitar using harmonics and, and um, open strings in different parts of the, of, the, of, the, of the strings. And that's what you hear in the, in, the, in the second movement. If you pay attention, I don't know if everybody hears these this, uh, changes in the, in the fingerings. Because they are they are very small and the, the piece is, is has so many layers and and your attention goes to the to the text of course, but anyway this and this I found amazing from 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 Peter and I find this amazing from from a, com composers that they are so interested in these small details that to me as a I'm a performer I wonder if they're going to come through, but well it's there in the recording for anyone to, to, to pay attention and to listen. Oh, it's the same, but it's different. And I think that's what he wanted, Peter, to, to have this, this feeling of sameness, but difference constantly, right? Yeah. The, his, he, he told me that the guitar part in, his, in the second movement is, is God. And that's what Alan Watts is talking about, the time and what, what keeps the universe together and so the guitar part is what is constant it's always the same but it's not if you pay attention it's never the same right so um i was fascinated by the you know that i'm i'm a guitarist i've just played this part but i am playing god <laughs> you know i'm playing this this meaningful part in a in a play you know so back to your question then the the first movement uses this rhythmic sameness right but difference so it's all again rhythmic cycles that are that never repeat and then he compresses the 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 harmonic range from from this b chord b and a triads to B, but with his his ear, he he, he needs to to be uh, he needs it to be a, a different a crunchier B, right? So he he has us um, restring the guitar in a way that one guitar has uh, a low B and another guitar has a middle B. Yeah, so it would be I think the if you go, if you play the, the, the B on the seventh fret, that would be one guitar playing that B, and the other guitar is playing the B uh, second string. So we met, Pete came up with a, with, a, with a way of getting those notes on, on, on either guitars with different strings. I don't remember exactly, but I, which, what, who was playing which, but it can be that the, the person playing the low B had like 
one fifth, two fifth strings, one fourth tuned down, uh, something like that. Like there was, there was, it was a, a, a very funny looking guitar with the same mm -hmm. string or very similar strings, two, two different kinds of strings. Yeah. So you're relying on like the, the different string diameters to get those, yeah. you know, get the sounds, microtonal variations of the same pitch. And exactly, you're not getting any prescription of, you know, how those microtonal uh, variations are actually occurring from the composer he's leaving it up to you he's not yeah. saying okay i want this this string to be you know b and then i want this one to be six cents sharp no, and I no, want no this one to be 14 cents flat <laughs> he's leaving it up to you and well you're he, using he, all of that to it was just purely ear by ear like yeah tune a b and then tune down and up like stay in this range and if you if you could hear a a, a note sticking out it mean it would meant that you were too high or too low so you had to be in, in this range where it, it sounds like a bee swarm, you know. And I was I was listening to the to the recording on the our record on the release, and I was sitting down in my computer on my own here in this room, same room, and with the headphones on. And I was sitting down and thinking, okay, I will use the time and I don't know, like read some emails, but I it was like. Like the sound is like, what is this? You know, it really captures your your ears. Tell tell you like, listen, listen, listen. This is. Yeah, I was gonna say it actually kind of does sound like a swarm of bees. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I I agree. And to play that well as a player, you're focused on the. <laughs> I don't know how it was for you, Pete, but focused on the click track. And the. And counting the the rhythms like this is one two three one two one one two you know like, and then all the, the rest is happening and then to listen to it for the for, for for the first time without this commitment was was delicious. Yeah, I was gonna say you know like that the timing and the amount of focus that this piece must take must be incredible. Not only is it just long especially if you play all three movements and i think he says in the performance notes that the three movements can stand alone as individual pieces as well but i mean you're performing for 85 minutes and you know i'm looking at the first movement um mm -hmm. with the score that you sent me and listening along and i just can't follow <laughs> because all the strings are producing more or less the same pitch. And so you have this graphic notation that's suggesting one thing and my ears are hearing <laughs> something else. So talk a little bit about just, you know, how much, you know, you, you're talking about like focusing a lot on a click track. The rhythms are, you know, sort of the same, but not. Um, talk about just how your experiences as a performer in this piece where, it takes so much focus and so much concentration to really perform the piece well in the way that Peter envisioned it sounding. Yeah, it, 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 it's actually, um, I, I, I don't want to like push that too far in, in too, too, too much of a sort of, you know, th there is a Buddhist um, uh, uh, sort of background to a lot of those texts and to a lot of the, the, the thought behind some of this piece, I think, um, philosophically. I don't want to push it too much into that kind of realm in terms of performing to sort of suggest an out of body experience, but it's it's really it, it, uh, it's really brutal. It's really tough. It's a real concentration um, killer. Um, we split the tasks. Let's say the the running line that stop that goes for twenty five minutes solid in the in what Santiago takes, and the running line of twenty five minutes of only sixteenth notes in stereo I take. Um, and there's no let up, but you, you do enter another kind of experience of time while doing it. And, and it, I, I, I do really enjoy performing that piece, I have to say. Um, the, the first movement is also, as you identified while, while trying to follow the score, is uh, you, you, you cannot get out in that because you're not going to get back in again. <laughs> it's, um, it, but it's also a lot of fun. And that first movement is there's four of us playing that. Uh, rhythm. There's two uh, keyboards playing samples of 
guitar-like string sounds. Um, so we're all, uh, you know, following along and, and giving little, you know, nods and uh, clicks to suggest, you know, here we come, next letter. Yeah. So the keyboards are actually playing what I thought might have been processed versions of your guitars then. Some of them, exactly. It's not processed, but it is, some of it is um, recordings of guitar notes that we played and then threw into a sampler and played around with. A lot of it is, um, like you say, it's not prescribed specifically in the score, but it is built up to a rehearsal process. I think one of the important things about this piece is that idea of, uh, of uh, collaboration with Peter and that idea of knowing each other so well, having worked together over the years, that what happens in the rehearsal room. I think it's quite daring of him to come with such a big movement, you know, 25 minutes of music, which is just, you know, almost in, uh, as, as it comes in a blueprint with that, uh, you know, the tablature that you saw. And that's the only thing that people have on the, on the page. So you build up this massive um, sonic bath all in the rehearsal room and deciding to what extent the string should be tuned up or down happens at that moment and tweaking all the samples was happening in the rehearsal uh, uh, space as well becomes a really uh, becomes a really vital and 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 fantastically uh, lively moment when you're building that kind of uh, sort of yeah as we said monument literally yeah um, Pete talk a little bit about the guitar that you're playing in Watts I'd see some very low notes in the score um, are you playing on a seven string or a baritone or something like that Th that's a very good question I I I think that the low note in Watts in the uh, electric guitar parts are typo. I, I, I do have a baritone for stereo, um, funnily enough. So we're both playing two classical guitars in mono, and then uh, Santiago picks up another classical guitar tuned with normal strings um, for Watts, and I switch to electric. I think I have like an Epiphone jazz guitar for that. Um, sort of blending with this beautiful Fender Rhodes. And then in, um, in stereo, it, it goes full on electric guitar mode. And uh, I have a, 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 I think a Fender Jaguar baritone that's been restrung with these, uh, all these Bs. And it just has a, a nice punchy sound, has a, you know, a nice Fender punchy sound to it. Um, but they're not, it's not tuned to a normal, bar normal baritone uh, <laughs> register, unfortunately. So one question that I have for you guys about, you know, these pieces where you have all these microtonal variations of one pitch, is this just like a nightmare for the wind players and your ensemble to tune to? I mean, there, you've got all these different Bs and they're kind of probably asking the question, like, which one do you want me to take as my baseline? That's exactly the question that they're asking. And, and it's infuriating for them and it's infuriating for doubly infuriated because we can't really tell them. You just go, yeah, I'm actually not sure which of the six strings it is. And it doesn't matter because you're not going to be able to pick it out from the, <laughs> from the mass of bees, as you've described it. Um, so you get this, I mean, it's almost like a, a mega, mega chorus pedal thrown across, uh, thrown across the bee and you just get a, a wave, a haze of sound. Um, and they have to tune, it, it's really done on, on ears and on the vibraphones and um, trying to pick out you know, you know, purely tuned uh, pitches from other instruments and they do their best to ignore the guitars, I have to say. Yeah, I, I was going to ask actually, because I actually saw some studio photos from a different ensemble that uses a lot of wind instruments and they had iPads on their stands with strobe tuner apps mm. pulled up for their recording. And I was wondering I, maybe if some of the wind players even, <laughs> you know, went that route, like I just need to have something so that I know that mm. what I'm playing is in tune for what I'm doing. I would have to check with them. I know that it, sometimes they, they, they will have a tuner out on the, on the stand. We do quite a lot of stuff, which is microtonal tuned uh, these days. So um, being able to pick out those pitches very carefully and specifically we, we use all the artificial aids available. Well, cool. Um, what's your own experience of time like when you're playing this piece? Do you feel like time passes just so slowly? Do you feel like it goes by faster than you would have ever, um, you know, expected it to? Um, this is a piece that's about, um, you know, our experience of time. What's your experience of time like as the performer? Well, for me, it feels like I'm sitting for a long time, 
but somehow it doesn't feel like 85 minutes. Like if you say 85 minutes, it sounds like a lot. But when you're there, you are immersed in the, in the task and in the, in the, well, the universe, no, that, that the sound universe that that's happening. The, and, and just staying in focus the whole time. So this, what, what, what Pete said, like, you cannot drop the focus at the same time. We have, we have a lot of resources to, to rely on like the click track and these bells that are hit on, on the rehearsal marks. So you know where you are all the time. So it's a, I think it's a, it's, it's a whole, it's a whole experience. Um, yeah. Um, how you say sensorial experience that you are focused on your task, but you're listening and you know how, how much longer it, it takes because you see, Rehearsal A, and then you say B, and then you say C, and then you see C. So you know where you are, and you know there's still a long way to go, but you just you just have to be very present. I mean, it's not like you don't have to be present in other types of music, but I think this this one, there is something that that like every action counts the same as as the others. For my part, the the first and second movements are, are very similar in that way and the third one is a, it's a bit different i sort of have more space to chill i have long notes like boom you know after having two movements of dan 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 bam 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 you know bam ba di da da di da da di da di di po po da 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 di da like this suddenly i have a chord like and it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> but you have to stay counting. Otherwise you are like, oh, suddenly Saskia plays the chord and you didn't play it. And it's okay then. So, um, so in that way, it's, it's, um, it's like that, that type of music that I've, that type of experiences I've had listening to music by James Tenney, where you look at the at the clock afterwards and you go like what 70 minutes i thought this was half an hour i i sat listening to a solo harp piece once and the, the performance was amazing it was so slow and she was doing all the movements so slowly that time was complete that was a completely different experience and it's like 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 that in this piece at least the times that we've performed it. Pete, what about you? How is your experience of time when you're performing this piece? You have kind of a different distribution of intensity than Santiago does. So what's it like for you? Yeah, it's, um, I, 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 I would share Santiago's sentiment there. I think that there's something about living in the moment and needing to really be present at every single second. And yet there's also something that, you know, that's to do with, I think that's something masterful in the way that Peter's written that piece and structured it um, and the pacing, you know, for me, it flies by. It's actually a, a wonderful experience that, that there's always something about to come or something that's, uh, you know, you're just in the middle of. Um, for, for me, the brutal movement as a performer is stereo. And the, you, there's, there's a sort of passing of time that happens with the turning of the pages. And there's about 35 pages of 16th notes. So I'm sort of playing along. And, you know, because all the strings are open strings, I can play with uh, one hand and then use the other hand to turn the pages. And at some point you think, well, this has gone on for a long time, but you're only on page 10. You think, gosh, yeah. another 25 pages of this. But it's always, you know, what's happening in and around you is so uh, rich and there's always so much, uh, you know, to focus on and enjoy it. It's, uh, the more we play it, the more you're able to, you know, exist in that world as much as um, dedicate yourself to your own uh, pitches. And so you guys are actually using paper to read this piece. I'm looking at it and think like, there's no way that you're not reading this off of a screen somehow. I think some of us on paper and some of us on iPads. I use both for the second movement. I use iPad and pedal because I have no. Yeah, there's no to, way right? to changing to change the page. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but well, for the rest, there's, there's always a moment you can go like this. Yeah. Um, so what's next for Ensemble Clown? What can we look forward to from you guys in the future? Yeah, I mean, we're, 
with, with the group we're looking forward we're, we're deep in rehearsals now we don't have any concerts um for the coming months fortunately because that probably wouldn't be going ahead um we've got a lot of things from the last year that have been postponed to next season and at the moment we've started uh, rehearsing up i think we've got about five or six productions coming into premiere in the months of september october november so we're trying to get a few of those uh, in shape and in order there's a uh, one of the themes for this year which has happened more or less by accident um is that we're doing a lot with singers so we have a we're sort of becoming a backing band for a lot of very very talented and very wonderful uh, solo singers. People like Elaine Michener and Agatha Zubel and um, and uh, Karen McFadden and all different productions. Um, so that's one of the themes for for the coming season. Really cool. Well, guys, uh, thanks so much for talking about uh, this amazing piece today. Um, the piece is Environments by Peter Adrians, performed by Ensemble Klong. It'll be released on March 25th, which is about the time this video will probably get posted. So um, keep an eye out for physical copies, digital, streaming, whatever floats your boat. And thank you both so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you.